There seems to be a lot of confusion in this whole aerosol versus droplet discussion, even in the medical community. So I thought I'd take a closer look. What actually is a droplet and what is an aerosol? There are different definitions, but it's most useful to differentiate them according to their behavior in the environment. Droplets are above 20 micrometers or microns in size. They're usually produced during things like coughs, sneezes, shouting, etc., and usually succumb to gravity, meaning that they fall down after traveling in the air for one to two meters. Aerosol, on the other hand, is made up of fine particles under 10 microns in diameter, and they can travel for many meters before they fall to the ground or some other surface. So an aerosol is below 10 microns and can travel far in the air. Droplets are larger than 20 microns. They usually succumb to gravity and fall to the ground. And then there are the in-between sized particles of 10 to 20 microns that can have somewhat of an intermediate behavior, but are generally thought to fall to the ground like droplets. And there's an even more granular distinction between the different aerosol particles. Those below 5 microns are so small that they can travel all the way down into the alveolar space where they can cause pneumonia, whereas particles below 10 and above 5 microns can only penetrate down below the glottis and are thought to land somewhere in the tracheal branch. When droplets fall on surfaces, uninfected individuals can pick them up and by touching their face can get infected. That's why hand washing is so crucial. To make matters more complicated, when the water component of droplets dries up in the air, when the wind and temperature conditions are right, the remaining bits of floating virus are called droplet nuclei, and these can then behave like aerosol too. Also, when wind conditions are right, even droplets might travel much further than two meters. When you go to the ocean on a windy day and feel the sea spray on your face, you've just encountered droplets that have become airborne. What does that mean for COVID-19 or influenza? Well, it means that actual suspension times of droplets will be far higher when there are significant cross flows, which is often the case in healthcare environments with doors opening, beds and equipment moving, and people walking back and forth constantly. So the general wisdom is that for stuff that flies around in the air that we must inhale in order to get sick, we need masks to protect ourselves and others. When we're dealing with droplets that are falling to the ground and on surfaces called fomites, we need hand hygiene and we need to keep a distance. So what about COVID-19 and the SARS-CoV-2 virus? Is it airborne and inhaled or droplet based via fomites in hands? Well, the uncomfortable truth is that we have evidence for both, which is also the case for influenza, by the way. Let's have a look at this paper from Wuhan University, Aerodynamic Characteristics and RNA Concentration of SARS-CoV-2 Aerosol in Wuhan Hospitals During the COVID-19 Outbreak. These authors looked at aerosol and surface samples at the Renmin Hospital of Wuhan University, which was and is designated for the treatment of severe cases of COVID-19. And the Wuzhang Fang Sang Field Hospital, one of the first temporary hospitals which was renovated from an indoor sports stadium to quarantine and treat mildly symptomatic patients, and from outdoor public areas in Wuhan during the coronavirus outbreak. They then measured the viral RNA concentrations in these specimens. It's important to know that these authors did not look at whether these viral specimens could infect cells in turn. They only looked for the presence of viral RNA. And here's what they found. In the patient area of Fang Sang Hospital, airborne viral load was minimal and was entirely absent in the intensive care unit of Renman Hospital. The negative pressure ventilation and higher air exchange rate inside the ICU, CCU, and ward room of Renman Hospital seem to have been effective in minimizing airborne SARS-CoV-2. Fang Sang Hospital hosted over 200 mildly symptomatic patients in each zone during the peak of the COVID-19 outbreak. 
However, the SARS-CoV-2 aerosol concentrations inside the patient hall were judged to be very low, with ranges between 1 to 9. They also took the position samples from two spots of the floor of the ICU rooms, and there they found a pretty high concentration. The deposited virus probably comes from the respiratory droplets or virus latin aerosol transmission. They also found elevated airborne SARS-CoV-2 concentrations inside the patient mobile toilet in Fangsang Hospital. This may come from either the patient's breath or the aerosolization of patient's feces or urine during use. We know that SARS-CoV-2 has been isolated from patient's stools and bladders and it's very much in line with another paper that we're going to get to shortly. The authors call for extra care and attention on the proper design, use, and disinfection of the toilets in hospitals and in communities to minimize the potential for transmission. What was particularly concerning in this paper is the high airborne concentration of virus in staff rooms, especially in changing rooms where staff removed their protective gear. The authors believe that one direct source of the high SARS-CoV-2 aerosol concentration in these changing rooms may be the resuspension of virus-laden aerosol from the surface of protective apparel while they are being removed. These resuspended aerosols originally may come from the direct deposition of respiratory droplets or virus latent aerosol onto the protective apparel while medical staff are working long hours inside the patient area. Another possible source, of course, is the resuspension of floor dust aerosol containing virus that were transferred from the patient area to the staff area via the staff's shoes. In public areas outside the hospital, they found that the majority of sample sites had undetectable or very low concentrations of SARS-CoV-2 aerosol. Except for one crowded gathering site about one meter to the entrance of a department store with customers frequently passing through and the other site next to the remnant hospital entrance where the outpatients and passengers passed by. Similar findings were reported by these authors. They performed air and surface samples of three COVID-19 patients in Singapore. Samples were taken in the patient's room, the anteroom, and the bathrooms. The samples of patients A and B were taken after cleaning and were all negative. For patient C, whose samples were collected before routine cleaning, they found positive results with 13 out of 15 room sites, or 87%, testing positive and three out of five toilet sites, or 60%, testing positive for the virus. All air samples were negative in this study. Now we have to consider that these were all special isolation rooms with a special kind of ventilation. The fact that air exhaust outlets tested positive suggests that small virus latent droplets were displaced and landed there. But it's important to remember that all of these studies looked at viral RNA or viral particles, but we don't know if these viral particles were still viable and able to infect humans or cells and culture. So how long will viral particles survive? How long after they fall on a surface or get suspended in the air will they stay viable and able to infect cells or humans? That's what these authors looked at. They suspended the virus in air and on various surfaces like copper, cardboard, steel, and plastic and took samples at various time points. They then looked to see whether that virus was still able to infect cells. So that's way stronger than just measuring RNA concentration. They found that SARS-CoV-2 was most stable on plastic with viable virus detectable up to 72 hours after application seen here in the rightmost pane followed by stainless steel with 24 hours, cardboard, and copper. Aerosolized virus remained viable for the entire experiment, which lasted three hours. So in summary, when it comes to viral load in the air, the data suggests that the concentration of suspended virus in the air increases from almost no virus in uncrowded public places ICUs and isolation rooms, to a little more in crowded outdoors areas, even more in medical staff rooms and patient toilets, 
to a lot in staff changing rooms where they take off their protective apparel. In general, the concentration of virus in the air inside hospitals seems to be low, but may be significantly elevated when staff having spent long hours taking care of patients with aerosol and droplets being deposited on their protective gear, when they then take off the protective equipment, deposited materials might become resuspended in the air. Medical staff might have a false sense of security when they're outside the patient's rooms, like in medical staff rooms or changing rooms. But the data suggests that these are the places where they're most likely to be infected. What the data also show is that patient toilets seem to be particularly prone to contamination and heightened cleaning measures in these toilets seem to be necessary to prevent transmission. One last statement coming from this paper. These authors say that if their ongoing contradictory finding in multiple studies, as with influenza and potentially also SARS-CoV-2, it may be more likely that the various transmission routes may predominate in different settings, making the airborne route for that particular pathogen more of an opportunistic pathway rather than the norm. This means that the airborne route is probably mainly relevant for certain situations. And I'd say that would be the hospitals and hospital staff, as well as crowded and badly ventilated public spaces. Everyone else is probably more likely to get the virus through touching surfaces, bad hand hygiene, and touching their face.